Well, I got to watch the Twitter feed. That's <laughs> a, I got to watch the Twitter feed for all the people watching online. It's so weird. They post all these crazy things. Just like, <laughs> oh, well. Got to wade through it. Go, okay. okay. This was a joke. Oh, this is a real question. Sella steals in the tall grass feed. You should say that. Oh, they, then you know, the Hollywood who, people. Um, Tony Tyson oh. refers to LSST like that. So, so. Yeah, that's what we get all the Hollywood people. So. Yeah. <laughs> we get more, more cookie treats. <laughs> yes. Speaking of cookie treats, um, there is a reception after the next talk uh, just outside. Um, and then, why don't I introduce Monsi now? Uh, so, um, Monsi is the final talk of the afternoon, sort of winding into um, uh, what will be a real survey in two weeks? Not even? Yeah. Not even, like Not even two yeah. weeks, <laughs> uh, a few days um, with the Zwicky Transient Facility. Uh, so uh, her talk is on uh, real-time response to understanding our dynamic sky. Please take it over, Monsi. Thank you, Peter. All right, um, so let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so we've, as we've heard all day today, um, there's, uh, this is a really fun time to be doing time domain astronomy. Um, there's a, a, a whole set of discovery engines that are coming online uh, thanks to technological advances in the optical, the infrared, the high energy, the radio, just about every wavelength you can think of, there seems to be a speed up in the rate at which we can make movies of the sky and image the sky over and over again to look for time variable phenomena. So this, uh, this explosion in discovery engines is what's uh, driving a lot of the uh, energy and excitement and science in this talk. Um, so I just wanted to set that as the backdrop. But one, if there's one point that I want you to take away is that time domain science now is, is at a place where rapid response follow-up is key. So we, we can't wait for years and go back and look in archives and, and, and do archival science. We really are trying to do science in real time. Response has to be super rapid. So for example, here you see a northern projection of the, of the globe, and this is just an example. Um, the idea is that if, say, you discover an event on beautiful Palomar Observatory in Southern California, just, uh, just a few hundred miles south of here, um, and I'll tell you why this is my favorite mountain top, but, uh, but uh, I'm just a little bit biased there. <laughs> okay, but Palomar Observatory say we discover something. Now, if you're discovering something that's very young or very fast fading, um, or anything that's fading away, disappearing on our time scales, then the biggest thing you have to contend with in this game is, is sunrise. So the sun rises in a few hours, and you have to stop collecting data from that mountain top. So in that situation, you have no choice but to make friends with people around the world and go west. So west of California is the Pacific Ocean, but thankfully there is the island of Hawaii with beautiful set of telescopes there, um, and amongst the biggest in the, in the world. Um, and then you can keep going to Japan, Taiwan, India, Israel, Sweden in this particular example um, to continue to collect data and beat sunrise as you go around the globe. Um, so this is what gives you very rapid response, and I'll give you several examples of the kind of science that something like this, a network like this, um, enables. Um, and this particular project here called Growth is, is a National Science Foundation uh, Partnership in International Research and Education Program. So let's start from the beginning. Um, this is uh, the venerable Palmar 48-inch telescope. I think uh, Josh showed a picture of this as well. Um, this has been around for decades. Um, this is, um, and this is, uh, in the, uh, let me just focus on the last decade of what this fine telescope has done. It has a rich history, it's done the Palomar Observatory Sky Surveys and several surveys even before then. But I just want to focus on the last decade. Um, and the three surveys that have happened uh, from, but primarily the same team um, are the Palma Transient Factory Survey that began in 2009 
and then the <laughs> intermediate Palomar Transient Factory Survey, and this brand new uh, camera that we are all very excited about, uh, which is this Wiki Transient Facility, which is a whopping 47 square degree camera. This is a camera the size of photographic plates, so it's literally silicon that's this much in, in size uh, that's now been, that fills up the focal plane of this telescope and can survey the sky at an unprecedented rate. But let's start right here from the beginning. Um, the Palma Transient Factory was began on an old telescope with an old camera. It was a recycled camera from another telescope that didn't really care about that camera anymore. But the power of it was the software and the follow-up. The Intermediate Palma Transient Factory, something we call an entirely new project, we got new partners, uh, new funding, was exactly the same hardware, but completely new software, just rewriting the software. So, and it's not until this wiki transient facility that we're really getting into shiny new hardware here. But software is, is key and integral to any of the science that is being done and enabled by, by these surveys. So, um, so let me um, uh, tell you what the Intermediate Palma Transient Factory um, software pipeline was about. Um, so this is uh, the, the real-time <coughs> software pipe detection pipeline of the Intermediate Palma Transient Factory, which was just a rewrite of Peter's Palma Transient Factory pipeline um, and rewritten by a graduate <coughs> student. So, I mean, nothing dramatic here, uh, but extremely powerful, enough to define an entirely new project that, that does science that was just not possible um, in the years before. Um, this here is a, a flowchart of the different components of the pipeline. Um, there's a lot of information here. In the morning, um, you heard uh, uh, Josh describe uh, the machine learning box. This box didn't even exist a decade ago. And uh, when Josh came up with this idea of, of employing machine learning to distinguish real sources um, from bogus sources, he really led, uh, uh, I think, started a cottage industry. We are now at the fifth version of the, re of the machine learning um, algorithms that and training sets have improved and performance has improved. Um, Josh inspired a group at um, JPL and then at uh, Los Alamos National Lab to again contribute new algorithms, new ways of approaching this problem and improving the real bogus classification. And as I said, we're already in, in the matter of a few years at, at the fifth uh, generation of this particular box, which didn't even exist when we, when we started. But all of this um, rewriting of software uh, that uh, a graduate student working with Peter E. Chow um, did was to improve the speed. So this is here a comparison of speed performance from uh, E. Chow's paper here. And you can see with exactly the same hardware, but rewriting the software, the, the pipeline turnaround time, uh, which had a median of something like 30 to 40 minutes, came down to less than 10 minutes. And this factor of um, three uh, to four improvement made a huge difference to the science. And, and I'll tell you again in a few minutes on what impact this had on the science. Um, with ZTF, uh, now we have data volume that's now an order of magnitude larger uh, because we have not only do we have a camera with a much larger field of view, we also have electronics that can read out the data in this camera much, much faster. So instead of taking 40 seconds to read out this tiny little uh, set of chips here, we now only take eight seconds to read out this giant mosaic. So it's both improvements in um, camera electronics as well as in, in CCD technology here uh, that are, are making ZTF an, a factor of 12 faster in volumetric survey speed and a factor of 15 faster in, um, in aerial survey speed than its predecessor, uh, the Palma Transient Factory. And I'm happy to report this Wiki Transient Facility camera has had first light actually a couple of months ago now. Uh, this is our first light image. Um, all of you, I hope, recognize the Orion constellation. Um, this here is the field of view of the camera. So single snapshot. In 30 seconds, we image this entire region here um, of the Orion constellation. This is, this is a pretty zoom in of the horse head. Um, and the ZTF, uh, which is what I'll refer to this Wiki Transient Facility as, um, can now survey the sky at a rate of 3,750 square degrees an hour, 
which means we run out of sky to observe in a few hours. Um, so no matter what we do, we are an uber-fast um, <coughs> cadence survey where we can repeat large swaths of sky at a very rapid rate. And this is also important for the speed theme and, and the rare theme of transients that I'll talk about. Um, I also want to emphasize that uh, ZTF is a public-private partnership. Um, it's funded by the National Science Foundation Mid-Scale Innovation Program. And starting this summer, uh, there will be a, a completely, uh, I mean, half the survey is public and half the survey is private. And the public part of the survey, which is an all-sky survey at the three-day cadence and a galactic plane survey at one-day cadence, will be streamed out um, for the entire world to use um, starting this summer. And it's in exactly the same format as Eric Bell mentioned uh, that LSST alerts would be. So those of you interested in, in um, preparing for LSSD, um, you have some real data and real discoveries uh, to work with. So in terms of software, one of the major improvements um, in ZTF is that we've changed the uh, image subtraction algorithm that we use. Um, so Iran Ofwik and his graduate student Barak Zakeh at the Wiseman Institute um, came up with a new algorithm to do image subtraction. So when we think image subtraction is very easy, you just take A and a, do A minus B and, and out pops your subtraction image and, and you see what changed if you, when you subtract the two images. Um, it's complicated by the fact that, um, uh, that astronomers have to wrangle with the atmosphere and the changing conditions um, due to the, the speed at which the wind is blowing and changes to the point spread function. So you're basically convolving your PSF to match the PSF in your reference image before you do the subtraction. Um, so to most of the image subtraction algorithms out there right now um, have uh, developed from Allard and Lupton, uh, uh, I think uh, two decades ago now. Um, but th this, uh, uh, these algorithms have a large, large number of false positives. And that's what motivated the machine learning exercise earlier. Um, this new algorithm, which is mathematically more optimal, um, that uh, Iran and his graduate student Barak Zake came up with, um, you can see uh, does, uh, uh, if you just look at the difference image, so this is now a new image, subtract the reference image, here's a difference image. If you compare these two difference images, you don't have much to choose from. They look about as uh, junky, and uh, you can see that there are lots of positive, negative, yin, yangs in both of them. Not very impressive. What is impressive about this algorithm is that it deals with the uh, statistical noise properties of the image much better, and in addition to a difference image, it gives you something called a score image, which tells you the significance of a source. So you can see a very faint trail here of um, sources that were injected. And those are the only sources that are flagged as astrophysically real in this uh, score image above a threshold of five. Um, and you can see it's very, very hard. You can maybe, um, if you have very good eyes, make out those images in the Salad and Lupton procedure, but they're very, very hard to identify. I can give you another example where your PSFs are horizontal, uh, sorry, vertical in the new image and horizontal in the reference image. Um, and here, I mean, something like this with asymmetric PSFs actually very cleanly subtracts out in the difference image here. Um, but uh, Allard and Lupton struggles with this sort of um, uh, PSF rotation behavior. And again, the injected sources are nicely recovered. Um, through this technique. So this is something that uh, ZTF has already adopted um, in its image subtraction um, algorithms, and I believe LS LSST is also uh, seriously considering whether to adopt this into their pipelines. Um, the pipeline in itself is, um, it has a more complicated flowchart. Actually, each of these boxes come out into more boxes. I'm, I'm showing an oversimplified version here. And it's being written by, uh, by staff scientists at uh, the Infrared Processing and Analysis Center at Caltech. Um, it's a little bit more serious in the sense that there's a lot of documentation, um, deliverables. Um, uh, you can't just go and edit a line in the code, which was something that actually I loved about the PTF and IPTF pipelines, because you could wake up with a new idea and by the afternoon implement it in the code and see the results that night. Um, that's no longer possible uh, with the CTF pipeline, but it is, it is much more um, robust and reliable and, um, and very well documented and, uh, and, uh, and yeah, written by serious uh, computer scientists, no students and postdocs. Are you using many open source components in this? Um, 
Uh, I would say some, but not, uh, not exclusively. For example, we use things like Scamp and Swarp, which are um, open source. Zogi is, I mean, I think the algorithm is open source, but the implementation is, is not. Um, the entire code is not open source. Um, as, as the pipeline of value evolves over time, how do you manage reporting version changes in metadata? For right. So um, this is something that I mean, each of the um, each of the candidates comes with a version of the both the pipeline as well as a machine learning algorithm that's used. So you could go back and uh, keep track of that. So everything, I mean, everything's version controlled and, and tagged. But things won't get reprocessed. If you went and found a line in the code that you absolutely wanted to change, it's very hard to imagine that there'll be back reprocessing just because data volume is very large, um, or at least not immediately. Um, OK, so after, after the software pipeline that, that takes the image from tonight, subtracts from a reference the previous night, and says, here is a list of candidate transients. Here's the alert stream in Eric Bum's uh, parlance from the morning. What happens next? Um, and for that, uh, you know, for the past decade, uh, we've been developing um, a piece of code um, for astronomers to, uh, to be able to understand and get to the science of what we want to do. Um, this is something that we call the follow-up marshal. Um, this is simply you know, the astronomer's Facebook page, so to speak. Um, so you, you can log in here, and you can see things specific to your program. You can see what's happened last night, what the most viewed candidates are, you know, the things with the biggest thumbs ups, uh, likes on Facebook. Um, but more seriously, this is, a, uh, this is a way for us to coordinate um, the follow-up observations of this large stream of candidates. And here in a very big uh, size, I wanted to highlight an undergraduate student, Chris Canella, who's taken this code that's evolved over the past decade for the Palma Transient Factory and then for the intermediate Palma Transient Factory, as we think of new ways to, um, to adapt this code, new ways to filter the data, new ways to do follow-up with the data. He's taken this code that's sort of been worked on by many, many grad students and postdocs over the years to sort of clean it up for um, use by, the, by this Wiki Transient Facility uh, collaboration. Here and he's applying for grad schools, by the way. So, did, did you <laughs> in computer know, science. Did you know uh, he lives literally five doors down from me? <laughs> That's where he's from. His, I wow. was, I, I met his father came okay. to me yesterday on the street and said, "Oh, thank you for writing letters for Christian graduate school." I was like, "I didn't so know this." He's applying for grad school uh, in no. computer science. Yes. <laughs> OK, so let's, let's uh, dissect some of these pages and, and their utility um, here. So step one is filtering, right? Um, so some of you may be familiar with the Large Hadron Collider, which has something called in-situ beamline triggers, right? What subset of the data are you interested in? So we have the equivalent of um, the beamline triggers, which is what we call filtering um, the candidate stream based on a specific science program. So each science program has actually a different filter on what this, this data stream that's coming through is. <coughs> and each of them defines this filter and then presents a list of candidate transients. And then members of that science program say, OK, this is garbage, this is real. So they save these candidates from, say, the ZTF data stream or any other data stream, actually, um, into the database, into the follow-up Marshall database. Now, once you've saved a candidate to the database, you could get very excited about um, uh, events and, and get extra spectroscopic data or UV, um, X-ray follow-up with SWIFT, et cetera. So here's a recent candidate in this beautiful uh, galaxy here, which turned out to be a stripped envelope um, supernova that we got very young. And uh, this here is a light curve, the spectrum, all kinds of jabbering of the science team um, about uh, the target, all kinds of cross-matching to various catalogs here, all kinds of follow-up assignments to this network of follow-up telescopes that, that, that you saw earlier, things that you can use to wake people up. They call their cell phones by, by sending them a text message in the middle of the night or just sending emails. You can subscribe to the feeds, add it to your favorite stable, whatever you want to do, right? And there's actually a lot more stuff uh, that cuts off the bottom of the slide here. So this is event-specific detail about any event in the database. Um, of course, when you're um, actually writing the papers, um, you want to know not just something about one event, but all the details of that particular science program. So you want to know end to end that, OK, ZTF sent 100,000 alerts. Of that, you picked 100 because of the filters that you defined. Of the 100, you got spectra of 95. 
I hope it's 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 at least that good. Um, and and you got the follow up by telescope A, telescope B, telescope C. This is what the light curves look like. This is what the distribution in redshifts look like. This is what the distribution in in properties, classification, subclassification um, looks like. So there's this report page that's again uh, just dynamically generated based on the data and the follow up marshal. Again, specific to any particular science program. Um, there's also this um, auto annotations, which, which is where you could take your lists of targets and cross match to your favorite catalog at, in a different wavelength or in a different database. Um, and again, just try to maximize the science that you're, that you're doing with that um, selected data set. Um, so um, at this point, what I'd like to do is uh, give you specific examples of why I've been saying the word speed, speed, speed multiple times, and speed being essential uh, to science. Um, so I'm going to give you three examples. Um, the first example, and I'm going to save my favorite, which is the gravitational wave event, last, because once I start talking about it, it might be hard to stop. It's way too, way too fun. Um, so I'll save that for the last. Um, but let me give you three examples of where um, speed and real-time pipelines and, and working uh, closely with computer scientists can make a huge difference to the science that a time domain astronomy survey delivers. So the first one is young supernovae. So catching a supernova in its infancy, and by which I mean less than 24 hours from the explosion of the star itself. <coughs> so example number one is say you have the core collapse of a massive star. Um, say you have a 10 or 15 solar mass star that undergoes core collapse and explodes. Now what you see in, the, in this situation um, for maybe not all, but at least some um, core collapse events, is that there's a flash in the pan effect. So very early, in the first few hours after explosion, you see these extremely high ionization lines, um, like uh, the helium-1-4686 line, the nitrogen-4 line, uh, the carbon-4 line. I think in this plot, there is an oxygen-6 line. So very, very high ionization states very, very briefly, just as a flash in the pan, before the supernova explosion itself, the blast wave just sweeps it all up. So in a few hours, these lines disappear. <coughs> but these lines are extremely critical to tell you what sort of progenitor wind uh, chemistry um, there is to, um, to diagnose. And in some cases, you could look really early and there is nothing. And that also tells you something about the, the properties of the star that actually exploded um, as a core collapse. So this is one of the motivations to catch supernovae very, very young, and then immediately trigger, uh, within a few hours, spectroscopic follow-up uh, by multiple telescopes around the world to understand how um, the, the properties of the star that actually exploded. Another example, um, this is of a stripped pardon the, uh, the type 1c. This is basically a, 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 a massive star again, which has stripped its envelope. So it's stripped not only its hydrogen envelope, but also its helium envelope. Um, this is the only example, actually, that we have of a type 1c supernova uh, that we caught so early that we actually see two peaks in the light curve. So we see this initial really bright peak and then the slower peak. And then, now you see, I'm labeling my spectra in hours. So 14 hours later, you see this helium-24686 line. You see it get weaker, and then you see it just disappear. At 33 hours, it's gone. So in hours after explosion, there's this high ionization line, the helium-24686 line in particular, which disappears on you. And, uh, and um, after some, uh, much analysis, if you try to interpret both the, the light curve and the spectra that you see in this particular case, um, one idea that we've come up with is that this is an ultra-stripped supernova uh, that is just forming a compact neutron star binary. So this is sort of the penultimate step to form a, a neutron star binary that's compact enough to merge within, within the Hubble time. Um, so that's a paper by a graduate student um, that's under review right now. A third example um, for supernovae and catching them really young is exploding white dwarfs. So these are the, the types of supernovae closest to Peter's heart here. 
uh, and Josh uh, already showed you this um, in the morning. Uh, this is the famous uh, PTF 11 KLY or Supernova 2011 FE uh, that was found just 11 hours after explosion. And I think on last count, there were more than 122 papers written about this one supernova alone. It's absolutely am amazing a discovery. And in this case, um, the type 1A supernova, as Josh mentioned, was this was the d most direct proof that this is actually an exploding white dwarf. And the open question was, it seemed like um, is, uh, the, there's something that's causing the white dwarf to explode, but the nature of the companion is unknown. And at least for this supernova, if you read all these papers, it seems like um, the consensus is that the companion to the white dwarf was another, possibly a white dwarf. It wasn't um, a single degenerate main sequence or a red giant star uh, that, it was, uh, that was its companion. On the other hand, a uh, graduate student, uh, E. Chao, for his thesis, the reason he was working so hard to improve the pipeline speed was to try to catch type 1A supernovae early. And in his sample, he found a type 1A supernova that had this bright UV bump at early time which was very different from supernova 2011 FE. And he attributes this really bright early UV emission to interaction of the, of the supernova with its companion star. So it might be that type 1E supernovae have different types of companion stars, and the nature of the companion is something, again, that very early data or very rapid response follow-up, in this case, by, by a satellite in space, the SWIFT satellite. Sorry, I, I, the, the correct name for that now is the Neil Gerald SWIFT Observatory um, was able to do. Um, and uh, and uh, this, this is, again, a very fundamental open science question on the nature of type 1E supernovae that uh, where speed matters. Okay, um, I'm going to change gears again to a completely different science case. Um, this is another place where speed matters, and that's relativistic explosions. Um, so, um, so of course, uh, relativistic explosions are gamma ray bursts, uh, where you have um, a jet, which is Lorentz factor of 100, um, and uh, that is uh, something that we have known about and studied for decades. What's new um, in understanding gamma ray bursts is that people are finding gamma ray bursts without the gamma rays. So without the assistance of gamma rays, these ground-based optical surveys are able to discover a phenomena as rare as GRBs just from the ground. So if you have a wide field camera that's able to image the sky fast enough um, and over a wide enough swath of sky, you can find gamma ray bursts without um, the assistance of gamma rays altogether. And in some cases, um, it's just a question of who, who saw it first. So we saw the case of IPTF14YB, where we see the optical afterglow of the gamma ray burst. We discovered it, we announced it, and then the gamma ray satellites will go back digging in the data, and they find the parents, the gamma ray parents of this optical afterglow. In some other cases, the gamma ray parents are not located or not yet found. For example, in this case of PTF11 AGG, we saw an optical afterglow, which looked very much like a gamma ray burst, but at least so far, it, it, the, the gamma ray parents have not been found. So the question is, are these often afterglows? Is there something, is there a mechanism like baryon loading that could turn off that really high power jet, but still give you um, afterglow emission um, in the optical and, and radio wave bands? Um, there's also the amusing case of, um, of Atlas 17 AEU, which was actually discovered uh, while following up a gravitational wave trigger. Again, completely, I think, <laughs> independent and unrelated to the gravitational wave trigger. Another happy story like Peter's of uh, what um, uh, follow-up of gravitational waves can do for you. Um, and this Atlas 17 AEU had both an optical and an X-ray um, afterglow very similar to normal uh, gamma ray bursts, but again, discovered by the Atlas survey. And in this case, at least we suspect uh, we might know what the parent GRB is, but the localization is coarse, so it's somewhat of a, of a statistical claim there. Uh, but something like ZTF, we expect to find you know, one young supernova of, the, of category one every night, uh, and we expect to find something like one um, often afterglow candidate every month. 
Um, so both of these science cases are going to speed up in terms of our understanding of them from a handful of examples to sample populations, I hope in the very near future. Okay, any questions so far? If the most distinctive, very early feature of certain supernovas or very high ionization states, mm -hmm. can you imagine any wide, wide field spectrograph that would detect them uh, and could be used to trigger other observations? Um, that's a great question. I mean, the most uh, amazing wide field spectrum that's coming online is the DESI survey. Uh, the prob and I think there are plans to look for supernovae even with the DESI survey. Um, but it's, it's more challenging, right? Because you need on only a spectrum of that one thing in the field which has the ionization lines. Um, and usually, if you're taking spectra, you need to integrate for longer um, over that, that, that large field. Um, so to get lucky enough to both find a supernova and for it to be young enough is it just the odds are um, I think harder, but I'll have to work out the numbers than having a wide field optical imaging survey and then just triggering, catching it in time to trigger um, a bigger telescope to get that is sensitive enough to detect these ionization lines. But, but the, the imaging, you have to have two images with some interval between them. In right. order Right. Check the change. So you have Absolutely. at least hours of, of 30 minutes is sort of a sweet spot to reject the biggest contaminant, um, which is asteroids. So we need to make sure that that, that um, object that we think is a supernova did not move right. in, in 30 minutes. And, that, and, and basically, we've, we've done now for this um, IPTF sample response within an hour or, or two um, for about a dozen events. Um, and with ZTF, I mean, the, the rate should be such that it's one every night, but we might only be limited by how much we can get spectra of, because the spectra need to be done with larger telescopes like yeah. Keck or Gemini. Point of curiosity, so for those, that asteroid contamination is unmapped asteroids? Yes, yes, unknown asteroids. Actually, it's, um, the minor planet checker is depressingly incomplete when we go push down to 19, 20, 21 magnitude. At 17th magnitude, I think it's still respectable, and we know about asteroids and their orbits. But um, at the depths that we look at, the sensitivity that we look at, it's grossly incomplete. I, I, I wouldn't believe or point a, point a telescope to anything with a single detection, because chances are it's an asteroid. To, and To give you an idea of how bad it is, the people who study asteroids for a living, when they go to a telescope to take additional observations, they themselves will take two images to confirm that the object is moving so they know where to point the telescope. Right. So, <laughs> right. so. so how, how far away are, are those two images from determining orbital elements? Um, I think, again, they, people, uh, so there's a whole solar system science working group as well that uses those, those two images to start to uh, narrow down the uncertainty in the orbit, but they'll get additional follow-up. And I think, uh, maybe Armin, you might know these numbers better, but I think usually three, or three, or three images or four images a night are the sweet spot for nicely constraining the orbit so that yeah. you can recover it without you, uncertainty. You if you have like three, it's still very, very fishy. You know? So everybody is trying to get at least four images in a given night uh, so that you don't lose uh, a lot of asteroids. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about uh, neutron star mergers, and uh, I'm super excited about this. So pardon the extra excitement, <laughs> uh, but uh, let's let's uh, let's talk about this. Um, so uh, the big deal, or I mean, the reason why you know living through an op an event like GW170817 was like living through a legend, um, is that it answers some very fundamental questions. And the first question that, uh, that this neutron star merger that Alessandra very nicely described is, is where are the heavy elements in the periodic table synthesized? So as of August 16th, 2017, all we knew were, that, were the elements marked in blue and that the fact that they were made in supernovae. Half the elements in the periodic table heavier than iron, so all the yellow uh, marked elements, it was only a matter of speculation or, or, or theory that these should be synthesized in merging neutron stars. 
we hadn't seen merging neutron stars. So it's, it's hard to believe that that was true. It was a very good educated guess by uh, Latimer and Schramm in 1974, but there was no data to, to back that up. And for me, the, one of the most spectacular images um, that were taken after um, this event was localized um, by, um, and the first announcement was by um, the Carnegie t uh, team um, using the SWOP 40 inch telescope uh, 10 hours after the event. But once it was localized, you know, several people took several spectra of these events. And one of the things that stood out to me the most was that the infrared spectrum showed these two giant bumps that no supernova in any library of supernovae had ever shown before. These bumps were so wide because there was a large amount of material that was moving at very high velocities. So the lines were all getting blended amongst each other. But what was remarkable was that Dan Kaysen, uh, right here at Berkeley, um, four years, actually now five years ago, um, if you just take his model predictions of what sort of spectra do you expect, from heavy elements that are radioactively decaying, that's this red line. This is just overplotting a prediction. I'm not trying to fit the data at all. I'm just overplotting Dan's um, prediction from, from five years ago, and it's pretty close. He can even reproduce the, the, the two bumps. Um, of course, I mean, this is uh, just one example of a spectrum. There's many, many spectra taken by many, many groups, all showing hard evidence that there's absolutely no question that the infrared emission um, that was seen from this neutron star neutron star merger of August 17th synthesized at least 0.04 solar masses of heavy elements. So this is more than 10,000 Earth masses of heavy elements. It's, it's a really large quantity of heavy elements, those elements marked in yellow um, that were synthesized. What you see in this movie is a sequence of spectra taken by the VL, taken with VLTX shooter by my collaborator Elena Pian, and you can see that the bumps and wiggles in these spectra and how they evolve as a function of time. This is where all the nuclear physics lies, and and I believe you know this is one of uh, several data sets um, that uh, that uh, theorists will model for for many years to come to try and figure out which elements in particular of these elements with atomic mass numbers between 70 and 200, which is something like 130 elements, which elements are actually contributing um, to, the, uh, to these lines and in what relative proportion. Um, so there's a whole suite of uh, nuclear physics that can be done thanks to these beautiful spectra uh, that were collected um, on almost a nightly basis um, by, by many, many different groups, all coming uh, to the same conclusion that, that no matter how you look at the data, no matter what analysis you do, there's no question that neutron star mergers are a prolific site of um, our process nucleosynthesis, the, the process by which you synthesize heavy elements in the periodic table. So that was the first uh, science question that, um, that uh, the rapid follow-up campaign that involved 70 observatories around the world and as Josh pointed out, 3,600 something, I think basically all the, all the time remain astronomers in the world, um, uh, in, in, um, did for you. The second question um, that uh, I'd like to point out here is the jet physics. So Alessandra mentioned to you um, that uh, there was um, a, a burst of gamma rays that was seen two seconds after uh, the event. Um, and this event, saw, you saw um, emission from across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So you saw the two neutron stars merge, and then two seconds later, you saw a burst of gamma rays. And then about 10 and a half hours later, uh, the optical emission uh, uh, was seen, and the infrared emission, and then 14 hours was the UV emission. And then nine days later, you saw X-ray photons. And then 16 days later, you saw radio photons. So every single band in the electromagnetic spectrum lit up uh, for this particular event, such that you could get to the heart of the jet physics that's actually driving uh, the emission in this particular case. Now, one would naively at first blush think that, OK, you saw a burst of gamma rays. The burst was pretty short. It was two seconds. So what we saw in this case was a short heart gamma ray burst coming from neutron star neutron star mergers. Um, unfortunately, that, that picture is not right. Um, this can neither be, um, so this relates to the first two surprises in the emission. So the infrared, I mean, I said, as I said, the theorist got an A plus grade, that they were very spot on, but at all the other wavelengths, they were struggling a bit more. 
So Alessandra, I think, briefly mentioned that the gamma ray emission was actually 10,000 times weaker, intrinsically less luminous, wimpier, than um, the gamma ray emission seen in cosmological short-heart gamma ray bursts. And the second surprise was that the X-ray and radio emission came after a long wait. It was actually delayed by, by many days, nine days for the X-ray and 16 days for the radio. And it's continuing to rise even now, right? I mean, all the way up, more than 100 days after the, uh, the merger, it's continuing to, to rise. So what this means is that the canonical um, jet model that's invoked for gamma ray bursts is not true. The, the gamma ray burst is so weak that there's no way you could have an intrinsically such a weak gamma ray burst break out of the material. So you could not be seeing an on-axis gamma ray burst. You could also not be seeing an off-axis gamma ray burst because these two uh, clues give you two different viewing angles. So say um, you had a jet in this direction and you were looking at the jet off-axis, so just a few degrees off-axis. Um, then the fact that the gamma rays were 10,000 times weaker means that you were 0.1 radian or 5 or 6 degrees off axis to see, um, that, to explain that observed gamma ray emission. But the radio and x-ray, the fact that the onset was so delayed and the shape was, was so slowly rising for such a long time means that you can't be just 5 or 6 degrees off axis. You need to be something like 20, 30, maybe 40 degrees off axis. So given that we only live on one planet Earth, which is where all, all of our telescopes are or on or around, um, you can't have two lines of sight to the same event. So you cannot simultaneously explain this with an off-axis gamma ray burst model. The third surprise was that um, thanks to the 70 telescopes around the world collecting data um, in many different UV optical infrared bands, uh, the UV data is from, again, from the Swift Observatory. Um, the emission in the, in the UV optical bands was extremely bright and extremely blue for a very long time. So uh, the infrared emission is easy to explain as heavy element radioactive decay, but the optical emission, which lasts for uh, so long, is, is much harder to explain um, in this context. And this, it doesn't matter you know, which data set or which subset of which data set you look at, um, the conclusion is still uh, the same, is that, is that it's very bright and blue at early times. So in order to explain um, these three surprises, um, we proposed a model called uh, the cocoon breakout model. So what we say here is that you have these two neutron star mergers, um, and as they come closer and closer together, there's a lot of tidal tails and a lot of material that's being thrown out in the surrounding medium. Um, so, the, so when the jet is actually, so when the two neutron stars merge and a jet is launched, the jet is not launched into a clean environment. The jet is launched into, into a lot of material such that the jet actually gets stuck. Um, and this jet transfers its, some of its energy, some or all of its energy, into the surrounding medium. Um, given that the jet has so much energy, so it's say it's a Lorentz factor of 100 jet, right? Um, moving at, which is at 0.999 uh, times the speed of light. Once it transfers all this energy into the surrounding medium, what it can do is that the surrounding medium itself can form what we call a cocoon, which is wide angle, mildly relativistic. So when I say mildly relativistic, I mean Lorentz factor of 2 to 3, which is still pretty fast, still about 0.9 times the speed of light. So the word mild is only relative to something that's a Lorentz factor of 100 and much, much faster. But if so much material, say uh, 0.05 solar masses of material, gets accelerated to such a high speed, then this, this wide angle, mildly relativistic cocoon, it could break out and give you an independent source of gamma rays. Um, so, when, um, so this can explain uh, the things that we see, which is that, um, as Alessandra told you, after the neutron star merger and the gravitational waves uh, that came from it, there was a two second, actually 1.7 seconds to be precise, time lag before the burst of gamma rays was seen. So the time lag is because of the time it takes for this cocoon uh, to break out. The fact that it was intrinsically less luminous is directly related to, again, this wide angle and this slow, slow speed of the material. So the low luminosity gamma rays are easy to explain. Again, because it's slower, it nicely explains the delay in the onset of the radio and x-ray emission, and then this continued rise over 100 days. 
And then the fact that all this material is now accelerated to 0.9 times the speed of light means just by Doppler boosting, you can explain the early blue emission that was bright for so long. Um, so very nicely, this model can, um, can address uh, the puzzle seen in the electromagnetic spectrum. So looking down the road a little bit, mm -hmm. you could certainly imagine different mass neutron stars merging that could have dirtier environments or right. cleaner environments. Right. So one could really expect that this picture could change radically. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, so let's go to the extreme where you form a neutron star black hole merger, where the mass ratio is, is, is very high. In that case, all this dynamical debris is in the, in, the, in the equatorial plane. So you don't have any stuff to form your cocoon. The cocoon does require material to be spread all around. And that would not happen if the mass ratio between the neutron star and black hole is very large. So that's why for neutron star black hole mergers, the most models predict that there'll be no UV optical emission. The emission would be exclusively in the infrared wave bands and be pretty hard to find <laughs> unless you build a wide field infrared camera to do that. The other big question is, what is the fate of the jet that formed the cocoon? Did the cocoon broke out? That's what we see right now. But did the jet also escape such that, say, you had friends in an alien civilization, uh, someone somewhere in the universe still saw a short hard gamma ray burst? And I think that's very much an open question because a, we don't have friends on that alien civilization in the perfect position just yet. And uh, B, we, have not, we are not seeing any evidence of that jet just yet. But we're continuing to collect data, continuing to hoping to see some evidence for the jet because absence of evidence is not evidence for absence. So I think that's very much an open question as to what happened to that jet uh, that gave rise to the cocoon. Um, one more thing that I'd like to mention um, on the topic of GW170817 um, is rates. Um, and this is again where uh, you know the power of two graduate students working with Peter and what computer science can do for you. So the entire LIGO-Virgo collaboration came up with a rate on the, of neutron star neutron star mergers of 320 to 4,740 per gigaparsec cube per year. What I want you to take away from that rate is that it's uncertain by more than an order of magnitude. That's the main thing I want you to take away from the first line. Uh, what Peter um, figured out was that this particular event, the counterpart was so bright that it would have been so easy to find in the PTF data that we have for the past decade. So with two, of, two graduate students, he, he figured out a way to go through the entire database at lightning speed and see if there was an event like GW170817 hiding in our database that we somehow missed. And it doesn't seem like we missed anything. Um, and so he can place a pretty firm limit on um, the, based on the non-detection of less than 800 per gigaparsec cube per year. So this reduces the uncertainty from an order of magnitude to only a factor of, uh, I guess, two, less than three, factor of three in the rate. That is really cool. Because the reason the rate is important is that now everybody's convinced that neutron star mergers is where all these heavy elements are synthesized. So the question is, are these the only places? Are they not only a site of our process nuclear synthesis, but the site of heavy element production? And if you, if you take 0.05 solar masses of ejecta that's contributing to the heavy elements um, that, that we see based on the infrared data, and you multiply by a number that's in between the 300 from LIGO and the 800 from PETA, then this, you, and say you take 500 per gigaparsec cube per year, the product of this actually equals the observed solar abundance. So, so it may be that depending on you know, whether it's the answer is closer to 300 or 800, but those really high numbers are very problematic from LIGO because they overproduce um, the observed solar abundances. Of course, there's a third parameter here on how well the material that's produced is mixed in and whether it's more uniformly distributed, how does a sun-like system differ from other environments, so on and so forth. So samples will, will answer this well, but this is just to illustrate again that Peter's lightning fast query of this database to pull out uh, GW170817 like events after we saw it was able to um, reduce the uncertainty in rates um, from more than an order of magnitude to less than a factor of three. Okay, um, so in uh, summary, um, as uh, was pointed out by Eric and then Josh and then Alessandra, 
Um, this is a fun time in time domain astronomy. Uh, the, the past was 10 to the 4 events per night. The present has begun with the Zwicky Transient Facility and 10 to the 5 events per night. And LSST would be 10 to the 6 events per night. So things are changing by an order of magnitude as we, as we see in the course of just few years. And um, to really get to the heart of some of the, the, the key science that time domain astronomers want to answer, I think a, a, a partnership between astronomers and computer scientists is, is essential. It's, there's no, uh, no question, at least in my mind, about that. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your time and attention and take any questions. We have, we have one question here uh, from Twitter account. The uh, black hole, black hole, and this actually applies to Alessandra too. Wanted to know what do you think are the prospects of seeing anything in the optical or IR from black hole, black hole mergers? Okay, um, so I can tell you honest, my view. Honest opinion. <laughs> my honest opinion is that black holes are very black. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but there is, I mean, the most compelling model, I would say, there are a bazillion models out there on, on black hole, black hole mergers and possible scenarios for electromagnetic radiation. But the most compelling model is that if in addition to two black holes, you had a companion, a third thing in the system, and that was somehow lighting up the material. Um, but to get all the details right, that might only happen in 1% or less of the systems. Um, but that, at least to me, is the picture is most compelling. But overall, you know, black holes are pretty black. But Alessandra may have a different view. So is it worthwhile <laughs> to follow them up? That's, that's the question. Um, so you think, I mean, and, and after how many non-detections would you say, OK, you know, I'll do it if I've got the time, but otherwise I'm not going to bother? So, so far with, uh, with PTF and I, uh, with, sorry, with PTF and IPTF, we followed up every single trigger that LIGO sent us that we could access. Uh, we have made no discrimination based on either its significance. I mean, we followed up complete things that were complete garbage later, black hole, black hole events, neutral. I mean, anything that we could follow up, we followed up. But going forward, I would say, I mean, um, with this Wiki transient facility, um, there, there might be time restrictions that are imposed on us. And uh, we, will, we don't plan to follow up black hole, black hole mergers. But I know there are other surveys out there that um, are even more uh, committed to gravitational wave follow-up of everything, and may, they might follow black hole, black hole mergers as well. Armin. So I think it's, a, it's also a question of depth. I mean, as you said, the counterpart will be very faint. Right. And so in the previous black hole mergers, the, search, uh, the areas were like hundreds or even thousands of square degrees. In the next O3, when we expect, you know, or better, on the order of like 100 or 200 right. uh, black hole mergers, a good number of them will have very good localization, more like on the 30 or 60 square degrees. These areas you can then go and really go to 23rd, 24th, or 25th magnitude. You can go really, really deep. And I think this will be the first meaningful constraints on that. I mean, right now, the, the area was just too big to get anything meaningful. The constraints are too shallow it's to be shallow. sensitive. I mean, Agreed. There's no chance in hell that you find something 18th or 19th magnitude. You know, and so, and then you have a thousand square degrees or 500 square degrees with like 200 supernovae happening. Uh, there's just no chance that you, that you can find something like that. I think that's still something to be determined. But do you believe there's astrophysical picture that is sufficiently I mean, compelling it's, it's for... Small, it's a small <laughs> chance. I think not. If I would have to bet my house, I would say no. Okay. <laughs> but if there's a 5% chance and we can look for two years and spend a small, relatively small telescope time to go and we look to 24th magnitude, I think that's definitely a parent space you would like to go. And I would say you could, um, you know, have the gamma ray counterpart help you, right? The yes. key question is, is the Fermi transient that was fine typical or not? Because then if you have some gamma ray counterpart, you could inference, you know, make some extrapolations of what's the energy that you could expect into an afterglow and maybe go after those that happen in massive galaxies so right. that you could have some hopes yeah. of potentially doing that. You know. But it is a big bet. It's, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a small, it's a relatively small chance, but... But if it's true, it's a big deal. Yeah, I mean, it's 60 square degrees. I mean, 60 square degrees, you can really cover 
relatively easy now with a new like they can, you know, you go with 20 force magnitude really easily and 10 pointings and you have it, 30 square degrees, 20, even 60. So this is doable in a couple of hours. And as Alessandra is pointing out, the gamma rays come for free, right? Yes. Because Fermi is looking at big chunks of the sky all the time anyway. Yeah. So. By the way, something that neither of you pointed out, but I think is the most incredible thing about the GRB observation two seconds afterwards, is it destroyed many alternative theories to general relativity with yep. just that observation. <laughs> so that is one of the, the coolest things, because I hate, I don't hate theorists, but <laughs> I, I hate theorists who come up with theories that can't be tested, and a lot of these theories fall into that. They did make one prediction, which is that the, um, <coughs> the gravitational waves should be much slower. And they weren't, and so this is a that was a great, great observation. So, perhaps along lines of testability. So, so do, do observations of these high energy events over a large volume, close to large volumes of the universe, uh, have any bearing on, on dark matter indications? Or? Oh, so there's actually, I mean, even with one event, people are ready to do cosmology. Um, so, uh, so basically, uh, this is what they call instead of like the standard candle approach that people use with type 1a supernovae as calibrators, this is now the standard <laughs> siren approach. So uh, LIGO, in addition to telling you that it, it was localized within 30 square degrees, also told us that it was localized between 40 plus or minus 8 megaparsec. So it also gives you a distance constraint in addition to the area constraint. And you know the right answer by looking at the distance from electromagnetic observations, that it was exactly 40 plus minus 1 megaparsec. Um, and by combining these two independent sets of information, you could once again derive um, the uh, value of H0 and cosmology and the rate, rate at which um, the universe is expanding and implications in dark matter, dark energy. All, all, I mean, all the things that you can do with cosmology. But of course, one event is, is very hard. I mean, the, it's consistent with everything right now. But, but with samples of events, there's certainly a group of aficionados who want to very seriously use them for cosmology applications. Um, whether it will be more precise and more constraining than type 1a supernovae and Planck constraints on H0 is, is debatable. Um, but it's an independent probe, which is cool. If I understand correctly, the brightness and blueness of the radiation from the cocoon mm -hmm. is a blue shifting, a Doppler blue shifting. Okay. Um, wouldn't it be a great confirmation of that hypothesis if you could detect the corresponding red shifted emission from the other side of the cocoon? The other side of the cocoon, I'm not sure. Well, the, you're seeing the blue shifted part is what's coming towards us at point 0.9c. Unfortunately, it gets blocked by the blue shifting part, so you can't see through it. It's optically it's too thick. totally opaque. Yeah, it's t totally opaque. Yeah, it's. It would be cool though if you just you just have to make friend cool. with it, make make some friends with aliens, right? We can get all <laughs> different lines of sights, right? And telescopes as good as us that are better. That, but yeah, that would be a very that's certainly a valid. Uh, uh, thing that should happen is that it's not just one direction on the cocoon. There's there definitely things happening on the backside as well. But there are other ideas to explain the early blue emission. One is this Doppler boosting by the cocoon. Another idea is that you're just lowering the opacity because of a disk wind that um, with neutrinos that are just irradiating and they're just lowering the opacity in the in the polar regions. Um, and I would say, you know, the biggest missing clue, uh, the biggest frustration in the data set that I have with GW170817 is that there's no data between two seconds later when we saw the gamma rays and then ten and a half hours later when Armin and his team um, found the optical counterpart. Uh, so there's a big hole there and, and that can tell you, I mean, and whether you see the UV emission rise or do make a bump, right? Rise and decline in that first few hours could distinguish between these four different models to try and explain the early blue emission. So UV satellite that can be the spot. <coughs> so uh, what give you the information on this hour, the missing hours? Is it because people didn't point at the right time? I mean, I'm, I'm very much of an outsider. So the the <laughs> well, Atlantic so Ocean. Yeah. So it was most, mostly very boring, which is that the rotation of the Earth came into the, the picture. So this particular re, uh, area was very close to the sun. 
Um, and um, at the time that the trigger came, it was above Western Australia. It could be accessed from Western Australia. But as Alessandra showed in her timeline, it took five hours before they were able to send out the map. So by that time, the, it shifted over South Africa, but it was actually already past South Africa. It was already in the Atlantic Ocean by the time the tighter map came. So you just had to keep waiting for another five and a half hours to cross the Atlantic and for the sun to set in Chile. And when the sun set in Chile, there were eight telescopes that were all observing and looking for the counterpart, right? So Armin's team at SWOP was the first to announce, but there were seven other teams that it was so bright that also saw the, the counterpart within minutes of each other. As well, or where the thing lands on this right time. It's only for the first event. For future events, it's actually a function of what DIGO's quadrupolar antenna sensitivity pattern is. So both Hanford and Louisiana are aligned. So um, all the northern events should be directly above North America, which thankfully has lots of telescopes. The southern events will be over Western Australia and have this systematic rotation problem to Chile or to Russia. But once Virgo ramps up in sensitivity and you have three interferometers, then there should be more of an isotropic uh, distribution. Then it's only a nighttime, daytime question. Right. But if you go into space, right, even in this particular case, uh, uh, if, uh, if there was a UV satellite like the SWIFT satellite that uh, was marching down a galaxy list, they just marched down a galaxy list in a slightly different order, they slewed to the position within five minutes of getting the trigger. So they could have gotten UV data had they chosen the order in which they marched on the galaxy list differently. So it was not impossible to get on target sooner. So that's my biggest regret with this, is that we could have been there even faster. So the, we actually got spectra, I think it was like one hour after the first image was taken. And so right. that was because, uh, it's on my team, it's, I'm only a member of the team. Uh, and, uh, but they were so fast that within an hour, they had the Magellan Telescope pointed at the source and got a spectra. It's the only spectra that we have from this first uh, night. And then all following up, uh, follow up spectra were taken the next day. It was also really important to get a spectra just to verify it's not just like a normal supernovae. I mean, that spectra itself is a featureless blue, very blue spectra. And uh, which could be something else, but it was definitely not one of these garden or IB type 1A, type 2P, or like, you know, any, it, it could not be 90% of the supernovae. So and Peter lost a bet on this. <laughs> I, I lost a half case of wine. <laughs> yes, and so that was actually important because then everybody knew, holy moly, this actually might be really the kilonova. And so the next night, uh, there was much higher urgency, I would say, than if it would have been not just this extra spectra of that night that really said like, hey, this is a really unusual transient, even if a, even without a gravitational wave, it would have said like, yeah, that's not a normal supernova. Yeah, and I, I would say I didn't believe it until I saw that infrared spectrum, right? I mean, this thing became, I mean, the optical just dropped like a rock and the infrared just rose and then you could see these giant bumps in the infrared, which was just like nothing we had ever seen before. I mean, that was just completely, Amazing. I mean, there's no question. I think there's no papers written that this particular counterpart is not related to the gravitational wave event. I mean, there were, there, I think, 120 papers written on this object by competing groups with competing ideas on interpretation and different data sets. But not a single group says that it's unassociated because association, the data is irrefutable. I mean, well, it's, yeah. it's irrefutable, but because of this first day data, there was already a really high chance that this is a kilonova. Not for sure, <coughs> but it was like, there is a transient, it's clearly a transient. Look at the, look at the spectra, it's not a normal type, uh, type supernova. And that moment, you can really li literally trigger everything uh, which has been done, all radio, I mean, everything got triggered. And that probably would have been a little bit more hesitant. People would have been more hesitant to trigger something right. without all of this effort in the first time. Yeah. So our speed, again, is very important in this game, just the main taken. Well, why don't we thank Monsi again, and then let's head out to the reception and ask more questions out there.